Praise to you, brothers and sisters. On the 27th of July 2020, a sermon by Todd White premiered from his YouTube channel where he was deeply convicted for his failure to preach the whole gospel. So this sermon he gave on the 26th of July um, in the church that he leads. So he speaks about discovering Spurgeon and George Whitefield. Um, he also says that he has been listening to Ray Comfort. Um, so for those who do not know who Ray Comfort is, I will leave a link to his YouTube channel on the description below and you can go check it. Um, you can go check the channel out. Um, so I will cover this clip by clip and I will give a response after each clip. So let's begin. I am so convicted I can't even tell you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trembling inside, it's hard for me to speak. I love God with everything in me. But the American church has lost the reality of what repentance looks like. And I'm broken. Because I don't ever want to be or even think that way in any way, shape, or form. Because all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat. I'm overwhelmed. Because I want you to stand before Jesus and not be and have no condemnation. That's the goal. Now, Todd White says that the American church has lost the reality of repentant, of what repentance looks like. Now, this is true. It is not just the American church, but I think this is a thing that is happening worldwide. And this is happening because of the American gospel or of the teachings of the man within the circles of within the circles that Todd White, is, Todd White is part of and other circles. Um, they have lost the reality of repentance because those who are in the pulpits do not preach it and do not preach it to their audience. Now, we speak against such ministries not because we are jealous or maybe we are on a mission of bad-mouthing them. Um, it is because we are worried about the souls that are, that are on the Broadway that leads to destruction or hell. Out of love, we tell that there is a wrath of God that is coming against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, this is Romans 1 verse 18, and that these faith healers are not giving them the truth or are not giving them the gospel. They're preaching a different gospel. That's a hard way to go there. So I'm talking to this kid, and, and I said to him, I said, bro, and, and this is one of the friends of that young man. And I said, hey, man. I said, buddy. And I shared my testimony with him just real quick, what happened, because that was me. That's how I lived. And he said, hey, man, I'm glad you found your path, which is a common, a common phrase because there's so much stuff out there. I just believe you're going to be a good person. And I asked him a question because they're partying. They're sleeping with whoever, they get a house, they rent a house, a group of guys rent a house for a week and however many girls they can be with, and that's the goal. And I said, let me ask you a question, you're a good person. I said, what if, I said, you guys are having a party like you do tonight, and I said, you end up sleeping with this girl and, and she's pretty and she's all that you believe she is. And then a month and a half later, you get a phone call from her lawyer because her dad found out that you slept with his daughter and she's 15. And I said, and you're like 20, right? Yeah. I said, let me ask you this. I said, what is that called? He goes, I don't know, man. He goes, that's heavy. I said, heavy? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Because you just told me how good of a person you were. Because that's what he said. That's the hardest for me. I'm just a good person. Because <laughs> good people don't need Jesus. They got their goodness. It's called self-righteousness. It's a horrible place to be. And I said to him, I said, bro, I said, I said, I said, you're a good person. And he said, yeah, he goes, of course, I'm, I'm a good person. I said, all right. I said, well, the day that you face the judge and you're in court because that 15-year-old girl, you slept with her, there's no way out, you did it. Now, what if she's pregnant? You I mean, there's really no way out. And he's like, well, I don't know, man, that's heavy, dude. I don't want to think about that. I said, well, you don't have to think about it, but let me just paint a scenario for you. I said, if you face that judge, I said, and you're sitting there in court, when you try to explain, and let's say you don't want a lawyer, you want to represent yourself, or you have a public defender, or you pay for a lawyer, let's just say that you're going to try to explain to that judge how good of a person you are. 
are you guilty or are you innocent? And he looked at me and he goes, well, I'm guilty. I said, well, what are you going to get? He said, I'm, I'm going to jail. I said, for how long? I said, is it right for the judge to convict you of that or would you say he's a bad judge? And he looked at me and he goes, well, I don't know, dude, that's heavy. I said, look, I said, this stuff happens every day. I said, is the judge a good judge or a bad judge if he convicts you? And he said, well, I guess he's a good judge, but he's a bad judge too. I said, why? I said, you broke the law. He looked at me and he goes, dude, that's heavy. He kept saying, that's heavy, that's heavy, that's heavy. That's all he kept saying, because he was a little drunk. And I said, man, I said, isn't that crazy? I said, you would say he's a good judge because he's going to force. Now let me paint another picture. Let's say that that 15-year-old girl is your daughter and another man slept with her. Now you're the dad that's sitting in the courtroom. Is that a good judge or a bad judge? He looked at me and he goes, I guess he's a good judge. I said, which is it, good or bad? See, what I, the crazy thing with me is that when I came in, I got shot at. I've shared my testimony. But like for the longest time, like I would say the longest time, I know how bad I hurt Jackie. I hurt her, I, I threatened to kill her. God, I know how bad I hurt Destiny. I know how bad I hurt my mom. I know how bad I hurt all these people. But that didn't save me. <laughs> that didn't save me. It's when I realized I offended God. Um, yes, Todd is right. If you are a good person, then you do not need a savior because you are doing everything right. Romans 5 verse 7 says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But unfortunately, you and I are not good people. We have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we need a savior. That's why we need Christ. Because for those who rely on Christ's righteousness, there is no condemnation. But for those who rely on their own righteousness, one day they will realize, or when they come before God, the just judge, they will realize that their righteousness was never enough to save them. So much that when I give my life to Jesus, it's equally horrible and detestable for me. What is the sign of repentance? That you hate sin. Are you with me or not? Sometimes we're like, well, come on, just get to the, no, 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 that's it. Like, is there a part in you that loves sin still? Something's wrong. Now, this is what Paul Washer usually says, that you know that you have truly repented by loving what God loves and hating what God hates. Um, you hate sin because God hates it and because living in sin grieves the Holy Spirit this, or the Holy Spirit that is in us. Um, when you come to Jesus, you must surrender to him. You must deny yourself. You must surrender to Christ. I read this and I want to read this to you because this hit me. Did you ever hear of Ray Comfort? Yeah. Amazing, just amazing. Like I, I was blown away. Now I don't, I didn't read a whole bunch of stuff, but this right here blew me away. It's just a scenario that, that rocked me to the core. I'm gonna read this to you. You guys ready? Okay. I, I just, this, this right here like overtook me. I was like, oh my gosh, because it's how you come in. When you come into the gospel because you came in for a better life, you've come in for the wrong gospel. When you come to Jesus because he's going to give you this and give you this, you really didn't surrender. See, what you're saying is that I've come to get this. What you've done is a taste test to see if it's true. <laughs> it's the same thing as getting a buzz. Well, I'll try this Jesus thing. Maybe there's a buzz in it. <laughs> That's not Jesus. It's full. Your goal as a Christian is to be conformed to his image, is to be transformed into his image, into his likeness, and to actually walk like Christ walked. Jesus didn't despise sinners, but he hated sin, and he addressed it all the time. And he said words like sinners to people that were in sin. Yet he loved them, and everybody followed him. What has flip-flopped in the church today? 
What has flip-flopped? Says there's two men that are seated on a plane. Oh my gosh. A stewardess gives the first man a parachute and instructs him to put it on because it will improve his flight. Not understanding how a parachute, could, a parachute could possibly improve his flight, the first passenger is a little skeptical. Finally, he decides to see if the claim is true. After strapping on the parachute, he notices his burdensome weight of the parachute. He has difficulty even sitting upright. Consoling himself with the promise of a better flight, our first passenger decides to give it a little time. Because he's the only one wearing a parachute, some of the other passengers began smirking at him and making fun of him, which only adds to his utter humiliation. Unable to stand it any longer, our friend slumps in his seat, unstraps the parachute, throws it to the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fill his heart because as far as he's concerned, he was told a lie. Another stewardess gives a second man a parachute, but listen to her instructions. She tells him to put it on because at any moment, he's going to be jumping out of the plane at 25,000 feet. Our second passenger gratefully straps the parachute on. He doesn't notice its weight on his shoulders, nor that he can't even sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what will happen if he jumped without it. When other passengers laugh at him, he's thinking, it's not funny, you're going to need a passenger, you're going to need a parachute too. The first man's motive for putting on that parachute was solely to improve his flight. As a result, he was humiliated by passengers, disillusioned by an unkept promise, and embittered against the stewardess who gave it to him. As far as he's concerned, he will never put that thing on again. He will never have it on his back again. The second man put the parachute on to escape the danger of the upcoming jump because he knew what would happen to him without it. He had a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart knowing he was, he'll be saved from certain death because he was given the ability to withstand the mockery, and he was given the ability to withstand the mockery of the passengers because he knows the end from the beginning. That's crazy. His attitude towards the stewardess who gave him that parachute was one of heartfelt gratitude. That's crazy. Now he continues after this clip um, on the video to explain how many people come to Jesus for a better life, um, a life without problems. Now, Todd White even says that this is a man-centered gospel, and that is true. How those people come to Christ for what they can gain from him, um, not for a shield from the wrath to come or for forgiveness of sin, sins, um, or to be conformed to the image of Christ. Um, they come to Christ for what they can benefit from him. Um, not because they love him and they want to be in his presence for all of eternity and live in his presence. That's a miracle. But if I come to Jesus and I say yes and I come and I become a part of a church or I just become a part of something where it's just a Sunday thing but I'm living in sin Monday through Sunday, what has really changed? And why would the world want the gospel from somebody that's not living it? Why would, why would people want what you have if you're not even excited about what you say you have? Why would people want what you say and want to change life if your life isn't changed? Why would they want your Jesus if your Jesus looks just like their life? They wouldn't. Are you guys with me? It's the gospel. I am so convicted. I'll never be a legalist, why? Because legally I could never walk out the commandments, never. I could never do it. What I do is I cling to Jesus all the more. There's no way that I can do this. There's no way. There's no way. Some people, I've talked to some people, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm, well my God would never do this and my God would never create a hell for people. My God is good and my God is this. Your God doesn't exist. He's a graven image of your mind. That's not God. Your God's not a holy God. I don't think it gets better than this. Um, Todd is telling his followers that the people who usually say my God is not like that, I can never worship a God like that. That, that God they worship um, is a God of their own imagination. That God does not exist. Um, and that is a different Jesus and he too does not exist. Um, we have set up idols in our hearts and we want a God like 
a God who likes what we like, um, a God we can control, and a God um, who do everything we want, um, and he must agree with it as long as we believe that it is right. That's the God we are looking for. And he towards, also mentions that that God does not exist. Um, yeah. In Christ, there is no shortcuts to this thing. You acknowledge it. Are you with me? You have to acknowledge that it's sin. You have to stop covering it. You have to, start ju you have to stop justifying why. I did this because. I justify this because. You can't, there's no justification. Everything is naked and open to the Lord. He sees it all. Regardless of what you think, you sinned against God, he sees it all and he wants you to be free from that. He so wants you to be free that he sent Jesus as the substitute so that you could see that Jesus died, paid the price for you to be free from sin, but to be free from a life of continuing sin. He did it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's the gospel. And what happened? Horrible stuff happened. But David admitted that he sinned against God. If we don't see that we've sinned against a holy God, there really can't be repentance. So that's all, my brothers and sisters. Now, First John chapter 1 verse 9 says if we confess our sin he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness now todd has presented the gospel correctly and the message is as we understand the gospel so the question is was he genuine um to be honest i do not know only the lord knows i think we should give him a chance and pray for him that he will bear fruit in accordance with repentance um, we can't expect him to remember everything he has said and denounce it now. Now, if this is the work of the Lord, he will lead Todd to forsaking everything he has stood for before and um, denounce the blasphemous statements he has made in the past. Let's continue to pray for him and bring him before the Lord. And remember also that you as a believer, you did not just change overnight. You did not just do everything right when you first converted, but rather everything unfolded according to the Lord's plan and will. Now remember, your thinking now is a thinking of a matured believer. So the things you expect taught to think, you would not have thought about when you first converted, when you first became a Christian. Furthermore, by doing this video, I'm not now endorsing Todd White. Um, I would still recommend to everyone not to listen to him yet, um, not to listen to him yet, unless for the purposes of apologetics. Now, to all those who said my channel and the American gospel were a work of the devil, um, I did a video on Todd White um, about two months ago. Um, so about, uh, some people commented there, said that my channel and the american gospel movies were the work of the enemy because we said todd was preaching another gospel now i'm wondering what do they have to say now that todd admits that with his own mouth that he was not preaching the full gospel and it, it is not like he was not preaching the full gospel but that he preached a different gospel um he preached a different jesus um so what do they have to say now now as he also says it with says it in the video itself or the sermon itself that what he preached on that sermon um the one that i'm reviewing here was a new stuff for him so yeah i just wanted to say that and leave it there now there's a tweet from james white that i would like to read um he says your overall understanding of theology may be far more consistent than todd white than todd white's has ever been but I have to ask myself and anyone else, when was the last time you cried when speaking of God's gospel and your unworthiness? Just a thought. Um, that's all from my side, my brothers and sisters. Um, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I will see you next time.